In a world where a lot of vampire media centers around really good-looking people pretending to be teenagers, it's always refreshing to come across a movie where vampires don't sparkle in the sun, they don't have daylight rings, and they're shown as what they truly are. Monsters. One of the films I feel that does vampires the best is 30 Days of Night. They've got it all, the sharp fangs, super speed, super strength, they burn in the sun, and also their own language. But it's far more than just the vampires that make 30 Days of Night a great movie. You take a great concept, great characters, great writing, and great horror and mix them all together, you're gonna turn out with a pretty great movie. There's also far more to 30 Days of Night than you might think. There's an air of mystery around some of the plot elements that go over your head the first time watching, or you might just forget about over the course of the film. A lot of these aspects you might not catch until the second or third viewing like I did, and I always like that about films. So in this video, I'm going to recap the movie so we're all on the same page, and then I'll go over those aspects that you might have missed, point out some of the mysteries about the vampires and why they're so great, and also just talk about what I liked and didn't like in general. So let's head on over to Barrow, Alaska, get all of the Oreos and Snapple we can, and prepare for 30 Days of Night. We start off the film getting a glimpse at the setting, Barrow, Alaska, the furthermost town in the US where for a month out of the year they are doused with 30 days of night. We then see a man looking at a large freighter boat in the distance. He walks over a hill and there's the town of Barrow, Alaska. On the last day of the sun, we see two officers investigating a pile of burned phones. They discuss why somebody would have done this, but can't really agree on a concrete answer. The two officers, Eben and Billy, go and change the sign of the population of people, turning it from around 500 to just above 100. We then cut to the town. A lot of people are leaving for the month because, let's face it, a whole month without the sun would suck. We meet Stella, who's taking inventory for her job as a fire marshal, and a man tries to convince her to stay, hoping that her and Eben, our main character, will rethink this whole separation thing, but she insists that she has to go catch her plane. At the dog cages, an unseen person raises a knife and slaughters the animals. Stella goes to leave for the airport without saying goodbye to Eben, but she's hit by a snow plow type of thing, I don't really know, so she calls Eben, saying that she needs a ride to the airport. Eben is taken back, because he didn't even know that Stella was in town, but he sends Billy to take her to the airport, telling her if there's ever a day that comes that she does want to talk to him, let him know. We then cut to Eben dealing with the dead snow dogs. He asks the owner John if he's made any enemies recently, but he says that he hasn't. Evan says that whoever did this is still around here, so he'll find him. He goes to the police station, which is apparently a family business in this town because his brother and grandma are there, and grandma says that there's even more trouble he has to take care of at the Utilidor. Billy arrives to take Stella to the airport, but they're too late, and she's not too happy that she's stuck here for the whole month. So Evan goes to the Utilidor, seeing that a man's helicopter has been completely destroyed by the Muffin Monster, which is a nice nickname for this contraption right here. At the radio station, the power goes out, and the man goes outside to investigate, soon getting surrounded by a bunch of strangers who start eating him. At the town's diner, the man from the beginning of the film asks for some liquor, but the waitress tells him that alcohol is illegal this month. He then asks for some raw hamburger, but she says you can either have it frozen or burned. He grabs the waitress's hand, and Eben walks in to defuse the situation. It doesn't work, so Stella pops in with her gun, and that does seem to work. Eben handcuffs the man, and the two ex-lovers have an awkward conversation in front of the entire restaurant. They share some small talk on the drive back to the police station, Eben saying that it's been a crazy day, and the man in the back seat says, just you wait. Eben interrogates the stranger, saying that he's not from around here, and he didn't fly in because somebody would have seen him, so who is he? The stranger stays quiet, so Eben leaves it alone. He then finds Grandma's stash of weed, and he says no wonder why Jake wanted to go and live with her. Grandma then says that the internet is down. Eben says that the phones are too, so he's gonna go check it out. The stranger speaks vaguely, saying things like you can board up your windows and hide, but it won't stop them. He says that they're gonna honor him for his work, and Eben asks who's they. 
Around the town, the power goes out, and the generators kick on. Eben goes to check the power station, finding Gus, the man from earlier, well, uh, he finds that his head is completely separated from his body. Eben goes to town, getting on the loudspeaker and telling everybody to go inside and load their weapons. At the police station, the stranger starts antagonizing the family, causing Jake to throw a piece of the board game at him. The stranger thanks him for the plastic, cause now he can break it and pick the lock with it, so Jake stands up to retrieve the piece and the stranger gets him in a headlock, Eben firing his gun to make him let go of his brother. Eben confronts the stranger again, losing his patience this time around, and the stranger tells him that they're all dead men, and he doesn't talk to dead men. Stella and Eben go looking for the people responsible for this, saying that they don't have many places to hide, and Eben says stop the truck because he thought he saw something. Stella hears a shriek of some sort and yells at Eben to get back in the truck. They take off, but something follows them, jumps on the truck, and tries to get in. Eben shoots it, but it seems to just make it angry. They go back into the town, seeing a car on fire, gunshots from around the town, and Helen crying for help over the walkie-talkie. They return to a bloodied police station, the stranger still inside the cell, upset because they didn't take him like he thought they would. Eben asks if they took his brother, and the stranger stays quiet. Eben breaks down, and the stranger asks him to finish him. He thinks about it for a second, but Stella convinces him not to. We then cut to the point of view of the creatures, aka the vampires, communicating in their own language. The leader of the vampires tells them that their heads must be separated from their bodies because they don't want to turn anybody into one of them. At the diner, the residents are discussing the situation around them, saying that there's no way out of town, bullets don't even slow them down, the phone lines are down, and they've killed so many people already. Notably, Jake is among the people in the diner. The head vampire scratches a vinyl, signaling some sort of call for the vampires to go on with a full-on attack. In a montage sequence, we see the townspeople trying their hardest to fight off the horde of vampires, though it doesn't do any good, and the town turns into a full-on slaughterhouse. Eben and Stella arrive at the diner, turning off the lights, and Eben reunites with his brother. The few of them left conjure up a plan on where they can go to stay safe. Eben says he'll go out and give them all a chance to run for it, and Stella insists on going with him. So they take the truck down the street to cause a diversion, and the vampires seem ready for it, grabbing the truck and flipping it over. They seem done for until Bo comes in with his plow and allows them to escape. They get in Bo's truck and head for safety. The house that they discussed would be the safest place is boarded up, but they go inside and pull down the attic, finding the others made it there safely. Outside, the shrieks of vampires and gunshots echo through the empty town, and the survivors in the attic discuss what to do from here. Jake suggests that these creatures are vampires, but Stella says that's just absolutely insane because vampires don't exist. Eben says that they'll sleep in shifts and survive here from now, saying that they all live here for a reason, because nobody else can. Inside the police station, the stranger is visited by the head vampire, Marlo. He commends the stranger, saying that he did everything he asked him to, and now they're gonna take care of him. The stranger seems happy and relieved, but the head vampire just kills him instead. In the attic, panic sets in, as the vampires start going through each of the neighboring houses looking for survivors, and some of the survivors in the attic think that they should leave while others think that they should stay. Things heat up until Eben puts stop to it. He says that if they can make it to the Utilidor, they can survive for the month but they'll have to wait until the next blizzard for enough cover to make it. A week later, a woman is walking down the street yelling for help. The vampire is on the rooftops behind her. Eben looks through the window to see her, and Carter says that they should go and get her, but Eben spots the vampires and says that they're using her as bait. The bait didn't work, and now the vampires surround her. She asks God for help, and Marlo waits for God's help, but he doesn't, and he says, no God and the vampires start toying with her before having their meal. Eben goes out to see what he can do, but it's too late to save the girl. He then finds John underneath a trailer, and Eben says that he'll get him to safety and get him something to eat since he's so hungry, but in the light, Eben realizes that John has turned into one of them. 
Eben tries to get him to stay back, but John becomes a full-on monster looking for something to eat. Eben finds an axe and is forced to put John out of his misery. He returns to the house, Bo and Stella coming to his aid, but he's exhausted and without his inhaler so he can't breathe properly. They let him get some rest and the old man Isaac, who has dementia and doesn't really understand what's going on, wants to get out of the house, making quite a bit of noise in the process. Stella and Isaac's son try to calm him down. They eventually get him calm, but he goes and locks himself in the bathroom. When they finally get in, they see that the window is open and Isaac escaped. Isaac's son pushes Stella off of him, waking up Eben and goes to find his dad. Eben helps Stella to her feet and the vampires enter the house. Just as they're about to find the attic, Isaac's son yells for his father outside and diverts their attention. He's quickly silenced, and the rest of the survivors in the attic realize just how close they were to getting found. Stella takes the blame on herself, saying that she could have tried harder, but Evan says it's hard to stop somebody when family is at stake. The conversation stops when footsteps sound on the roof, and Evan realizes that they aren't safe here anymore and they have to move. The blizzard comes and they all traverse the street trying to get to the Utilidor across town. They stop at the convenience store to get supplies, Eben assigning everybody a task of their own, while he gets himself an inhaler. While the survivors gather supplies, they find a young girl who's been turned into a vampire. It takes almost all of them to detain her, and Jake is forced to put an end to her. He's traumatized by his actions, even after Eben and Stella's hugs, and Bo telling him that he did the right thing. Nobody recognizes the little girl, so they wonder where she could have come from. By the time it's all over, the blizzard is over too, so they're forced to stay there for another week. They realize they have to leave once again, and Stella comes up with the idea of bringing the sun to them with Grandma's ultraviolet light. Great plan, Stella, but why wouldn't these things like light if they're not vampires? Vampires don't exist, Jake. Are you sure about that? Evan goes out to cause the distraction and lets the others escape, making all the noise he can to attract them to his location. He turns on the generator and heads inside, the others making a run for it, though the distraction didn't work 100%. They go to the police station, as Eben readies the ultraviolet light in the house. One of the vampires charges inside and gets hit with the light, and it actually works. Stella radios him to ask if it worked, and he says it did, but they're gonna cut the power off any second, and they do exactly that, forcing him to run. Bo tells Eben where to run, saying that it's his turn to create a distraction. Bo takes the tractor and goes through the town, not only creating a distraction, but taking out quite a few vampires in the process. Even a few with his gun, which nobody else seemed to be able to do. He crashes into a building, injured and out of ammo, but with a box of flares, or dynamite, not sure which one, and he blows up the building with all of them inside. Though it doesn't kill him, and he gets blasted outside, where Marlo, the head vampire, puts an end to him. Eben gets to the police station from Bo's distraction. Him and Stella embrace and mourn the loss of everyone. The survivors, now down to just six of them, but Carter says it's going to be five soon because he was bit by the little girl in the convenience store. He says he's ready to go and reunite with his own family, who were all killed by a drunk driver, and he wants Eben to do it. So they go in the other room, and Eben reunites Carter with his family. Another week later, on day 27, they spot an SOS coming from Billy's home, so Eben and Stella go to investigate. Billy, now long-haired and unshaven, has put his entire family to rest, saying that he heard the screams of everybody outside and didn't want to subject them to that. Eben takes this revelation particularly harsh, saying that when you have a family, you don't ever hurt them. They take Billy back to the police station, but all of the others are gone. Stella suggests that they went to the Utilidor, so they leave to go looking for them. They get underneath a trailer, but Stella sees a little girl walking in the road and goes to save her. This seems to have been another trap by the vampires, and Eben tells her to run for the Utilidor and he'll meet them there. Eben goes to face the vampires, and Billy comes with him, but they get separated and Billy runs off, so Eben continues onward to the Utilidor. 
He goes through a back entrance, not finding anybody else at first, but then they come out, but Stella and the young girl haven't gotten there yet. Marlo gives a pre-game speech, saying that it took centuries to make the world believe that they were all just bad dreams, so they can't give them any reason to believe they exist, so they have to destroy the rest of them. Billy goes to the Utilidor, using the same back entrance that Eben used, but this time he's followed. Eben radios Stella, but she doesn't answer. Billy calls out to the people in the Utilidor, but he's attacked by a vampire. Eben comes to the rescue, but the vampire fights him off and disarms him. Billy pushes the vampire into the Muffin Monster, but gets his hand caught, and Billy was also bit, so his screams of pain sound the same as a vampire, alerting them to his presence, so Eben has to put an end to his partner. The survivors are shocked and turn to the illegal booze when Stella radios in. She says she's stuck underneath a car, and they spot the car that she's talking about, but it's also surrounded by vampires. Eben wants to go and save them, but he has no idea how. The town is also filling up with oil from the pipeline, and Marlo sets it ablaze. Jake says that they can just wait it out here, which is true, but Stella will either die if she runs, or burn alive if she stays in place. Eben goes and takes a syringe from the medical supplies and gets some of Billy's blood injecting himself with the vampire blood, saying that they can't fight them the way that they are. Eben stands up, now a vampire himself, and goes outside to meet the other vampires and take one final stand. He fights Marlo, getting the upper hand for a moment before getting his ass kicked. He tells Stella to run, and the fight resumes, Eben getting a lucky punch in that ends the fight for good. The other vampires escape, and Eben asks Stella if he should go after them, but it's almost dawn. The remaining survivors all come out, watching their town crumble before them. Eben and Stella go to watch the sunrise, sharing one last kiss before Eben melts to ash in the wind. Stella holds on to him tightly and closes her eyes. So I think naturally everybody's first question when it comes to this movie is, is there really 30 days of night in Alaska? And the answer is no, there's not because there's actually 67 days of night, which to me sounds like a missed opportunity for a sequel. Oh wait, there already is a sequel to this film called 30 Days of Night, Dark Days, about how Stella goes to LA, but this isn't Stella at all, and this definitely doesn't seem like a good movie. But anyways, 30 Days of Night is actually based on a comic book of the same name that came out in 2002. The 2007 movie is more or less pretty accurate, but the film does take some liberties with adding in new characters or giving characters a more prominent role like Billy and the head vampire Marlo. So this film opened to pretty strong praise from fans and critics at the time of release, especially for a horror film, and over the years it's only gotten more praise from just about anybody I ever talked to about it. On a budget of 30 million, the film grossed 75 million worldwide, so it didn't do horrible, leading to the sequel, which did do horrible. But of course, the most notable thing in this movie are the vampires. The vampires in this film are quite honestly very unique to most other vampire films out there. You have the obvious romantic vampires that I mentioned, but even taking those out of the equation, these vampires stand out from other horror-themed vampires. In a way, I feel that these vampires are the most realistic and therefore horrific version of vampires that I've ever seen. They have the typical increased speed and strength, giving them the edge from their prey, but they also have an intelligence factor that is separate from humans. And this is honestly one of the scarier aspects of the film that I don't feel like gets enough credit. We very rarely see things from the vampire's point of view, and whenever we do, we get a huge bit of lore and explanation, sometimes veering into the exposition territory, but it's still very well done. We hear Marlo explaining that it's taken them centuries to make the world believe that they're just bad dreams, and they can't have any survivors telling the world about their existence. We also see that when one of their own is damaged, they have their own code to put them out of their misery. But some of the stuff that we don't see from their point of view really escalates the horror of the film. Near the middle of the film, we see a woman walking the streets crying for help, and the vampires are waiting on the rooftop for anybody that comes to her aid. 
no one does, so the plan failed, but instead of just killing her right away, they toy with her, scratching at her and hurting her before they have their meal. Scenes like this, and also when Marlo kills a man in front of his wife with a fire poker, prove that these vampires aren't just doing this as a need for survival, they aren't that animalistic, they truly thrive on seeing the pain and misery of those they kill. Marlo also tells the others that they have to make sure nobody turns into one of them, something that the vampires aren't that great of doing, but this couldn't have always been the case. At some point, these vampires must have been open to gaining more to their ranks. We know this because of the little girl in the convenience store. The survivors don't recognize this girl, she has a tattoo on her arm of some significance to Marlo's gang, and she's wearing a dress. Meaning that these vampires aren't just always trapped in the boat outside Barrow, they travel, and sometime over the years, they must have turned this little girl into one of them and she didn't come from Alaska. Marlo says that they should have come here a long time ago, because having 30 days of night really is the perfect situation for them to be in, but where they came from before that, and how long they've really been around and why, is still a complete mystery. There are a few indications, of course, like Marlo says it's taken them centuries to fool the rest of the world, but a very interesting moment comes from when the woman in the trap asks God for help. Marlo kind of scoffs at the word God, he waits a minute and says that God isn't coming to help you. If I were guessing, I'd say that these vampires, or at least Marlo, have some sort of history with religion or God or church that probably isn't so bright. But a big part of the vampires in this film is the help that they received from the stranger. Perhaps one of the most interesting characters in the film is The Stranger. I know most people have picked up on this already, but all throughout the first act of the film, Eben is responding to different calls about vandalism and murder. The very first scene he's in, we see that a lot of the town's phones have been burned. Then we see that all the sled dogs have been killed, and finally a helicopter has been smashed to pieces. This is all the work of the stranger, getting rid of any and all means of escape or contact to the outside world so that the vampires could arrive for their feast. But the stranger himself isn't exactly a vampire. We see that his goal is to become one and join them, saying that they're going to reward him for his efforts and all that he's done, but in the end, that doesn't work out. It took me a few watches to catch this, but The Stranger is actually a reference to Renfield. If you watched that new movie with Nicolas Cage and Nicholas Holt, you might already know what I'm talking about, but in vampire lore, Renfield is the one that does all of Dracula's dirty work setting up the targets for him, generally just making his life easier by doing tasks, you know, all around assistant work. Renfield also isn't quite human, but not vampire either. The stranger asks for some raw hamburger meat to eat, much like Renfield who only eats bugs and other living creatures in order to obtain their life force. But while much of the film's horror and honestly cool factor relies on the vampires and the stranger, the real heart of the film is of course the survivors. Eben is our protagonist, and yes I am saying Eben, E-B-E-N, why is it that and not Evan? I'm not sure, but his relationship with Stella is the through line of the film, and there's a lot of layers to their relationship. At the beginning of the film, the two are separated, but it's never really fully explained why that is. The whole town seems to want them together and wants Stella to stay for the month, but she doesn't want to, and Evan doesn't really try to convince her to stay either. While it's not fully explained, some of the themes of the film give us a good indication as to what happened. Eben, Jake, and Grandma are the only members of the family in the town of Barrow, and there's no mention of the parents anywhere in this film. At the end of the movie, Stella risks her life to save this child from the streets, knowing full well that it's probably a trap and Eben didn't want her to go, but she did it anyway. From small things like this, we can guess that Stella and Eben broke up because Eben didn't want to have kids and Stella did. With the parents out of the picture and Eben being more of a father figure to his teenage brother, it's quite possible that their real parents aren't that great or walked out on them. Or one of them died and then the other walked, really any scenario works, but Eben is riddled with some sort of parental issues. Stella, on the other hand, very much has that motherly instinct. 
Jake is very happy to see her, and even mentioned at one point that he lived with Evan and Stella, but wanted to move to Grandma's house, not at all because of the weed farm. Stella risks her own life to save the child, something that Evan very clearly didn't do. So I think it's not only possible, but probable that the reason for their breakup is because Evan didn't want to have kids, which would also make his character arc come full circle because he sacrifices himself to save Stella and the child that she's with. And I guess it does actually make sense for there to be a sequel. Stella looked pretty determined to get the other vampires at the end of the film. I just wish they could have at least gotten the same actress to play Stella for the sequel. The town of Barrow is a small place, less than 600 people when they're all there, and everybody knows everyone. This is made very clear throughout the film. Evan responds to all these calls, and each person that he talks to he seems to know on a personal level. The police station is a family-run business. Everybody tries to talk Stella into staying and make things better with Eben. There really isn't any boundaries here, and I think that this is all done very well to establish the town of Barrow. We also see a lot of different wide shots of the town in the beginning. There's a lot of people in the streets, most of them leaving, but regardless of how small this town is, it seems full of life. This is hugely contrasted to later in the film when the people in the streets are getting slaughtered by the vampires, and even after that, when the town seems completely empty. The character dynamics set up are all really well done, even outside of just Stella and Eben. Eben and his brother are very close, he's more of a father figure than an older brother, and Eben's partner Billy adds a whole different element of horror to the film itself. We see Billy as this like cool, calm, and charismatic person at the beginning of the film, and then we don't see him for almost the whole month, and then when we do, he's a completely different person. He's unkept and broken beyond repair, put his own family to rest so that they wouldn't have to endure a painful end by the vampires, and this is another scene where Eben reacts very harshly because he hurt his family, another possible indication of Eben's past. Billy's character adds a human element to the horror that wouldn't have been there otherwise. Obviously, the events going on in town that we see are horrific, but there's also an underlying story about what this would do to you as a human being. So scared of what could possibly happen that you take drastic measures against your family to save them from a possible worse end. Sure, getting ripped apart by vampires is horrific, but a human taking the lives of family members because of how terrified you are is a whole different kind of horror. The setting of Barrow is fantastic, the premise of vampires coming out with 30 days of night to play around with is a great concept that they take full advantage of, the writing is smart with things like the tractor and the UV light coming into play after being seen or mentioned beforehand, but this film is also far from perfect. There's a few questionable decisions that I was surprised with. I thought that the potential with the character of the stranger was far greater than what the role turned out to be. When I first watched this movie, I thought that once the vampires left him there the first time, the stranger would have helped the survivors live through the month, turning on the creatures that didn't give him a chance, and the stranger could have provided them with helpful information like how to kill vampires or how to survive. Maybe the stranger could have had Billy's fate at the end. I feel like that would have been a far better character arc for him to have rather than just being set up for the vampires and then quickly taken out of the story. There's also the scene where Stella saves the young girl that she knows apparently, and maybe I'm wrong on this, but I've seen this movie three times and I don't remember this little girl being anywhere else in the film. It just seemed to kind of come out of nowhere and could have used a scene or two to set up the connection and also flesh out Stella's character arc even more. There also isn't a ton of resolution to this story. The rest of the vampires got away, the town is on fire with no means to escape, I mean, I guess Stella survives for a sequel, but what about everybody else? What do the townspeople say to everybody else when they get back? Vampires are real and they now know this, but would anybody even believe them? What happens to Jake now that all of his parental figures and family are gone? 
does he go with Stella? All of these questions definitely intrigue me, but I guess as this is Evan's story primarily, it would make sense to end with his death. Overall, I think this is a supremely underrated movie. If you haven't seen it, I'd definitely give it a watch. Even after watching this video, you might pick up on something that I missed. If you're looking for me to score this film, I'd give it a solid, like, 7.7. .7. What are your thoughts on 30 Days a Night? Let me know in the comments below and also which movie you'd want me to cover next. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more content like this. If you do, then I'll see you in the next one. Yeah.